So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up like 20 minutes from here and I went to Arcadia. Um, like Abby said, I graduated in 2001. And I actually, I was a painting major while I was here. Um, and I guess like my, my senior thesis project, um, I started painting on aluminum panels and I would go to the steel yard and get aluminum and um, I don't know, I started to get like really interested in materials more so than the paint that I was working with. And um, after graduating, um, I did a post back year at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which is kind of like, if you're not fully going to an MFA program, it's like a, a year that's set up almost um, like an MFA program. So you can like see if it's something that you're interested in. Um, and so I had that year and I started um, I just started working in sculpture like it just seemed like this natural progress um, and um, and I just kind of went from there and I stayed on uh, to do my MFA at the Pennsylvania Academy um, and then right after graduating I um, I moved to New York which was really scary but um, um, I just you know I've been there ever since so I'll talk to you a little bit about my work over the years and um, other things that have influenced it and weird jobs that I've had that have helped out and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, so I'm going to start off. This is my graduate thesis from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Um, it was an installation. Uh, I was using a lot of rubber. Um, I, being a poor grad student, started going to like the bicycle shop and getting inner tubes and things that they would donate to me. And um, I used to get, um, at the time, you could order really cheap sample kits of casting rubbers. And, um, and I would just like experiment with everything. And, um, and I made this installation for my senior thesis um, that I think they were in shock. Pennsylvania Academy is pretty. It's a pretty conservative school, and um, it was a pretty um, interesting thesis discussion that I had with my faculty. But um, I was thinking a lot about the body at the time, and um, like my fascination with these broken down bodily structures, and um, using piping and debris as this metaphor for the body. Um, and I was using rubber because it was this like really heavy and dirty industrial material that was also like flexible and it would get like limp and it was really awkward to move around um, and everything was really rough like I was making my own molds I didn't know what I was doing um, and I would just throw everything in there like the mold is in there with the cast pieces and um, it just became this like pile of sort of debris that was referencing this um, fragmented like broken structure uh, and then part of that piece was um, shown at another space that's still in Philadelphia called the Slot Foundation. And so this is all the work in 2004. Um, and then I moved to New York. And um, that first year was pretty hard. Like, I didn't have a studio. I barely had an apartment. I was looking for just a job that would afford me, you know, food and living expenses. Um, and yeah, I was like flailing around trying to figure out what to do. And I made a lot of drawings on my floor. Um, I tried to use materials sculpturally like in my apartment, things that I could cook in the stove or whatever. And it was just a mess. Um, and so it took me like about a year or so to get my routine together. And I started working for um, a fabrication studio that did a lot of mannequins and we would make figures for like the National Park Service or other kind of museum institutions where you, um, you know, have like a scene of Native Americans and like pilgrims and things like that. And so my work got really influenced from the work I was doing at this studio. Um, I started doing a lot of life casting and I like conceptually was interested in the figure, but I had just, um, uh, I was using these other means to talk about it. And so 
um, I started to think about like just using the figure as the figure. Um, and so the work from this time was like very figurative. It was very dark and kind of post-apocalyptic. I was using a lot of rubbers. Um, I don't know if you can tell by the slide, but I would like intrinsically paint them. So they had all these layers that looked like skin and flesh and things like that. Um, and then these other things, I still call them figurative, but they're a lot more kind of like animalistic and um, everything's still very like dirty and kind of decaying in these broken down forms. Um, so I guess I used a lot of my painting techniques that I learned from underground, but I was just using them in different ways. Like still thinking about color and, um, and translucency and like layering these, um, like layering it up under the resins and the plastics and making it, trying to make it look like it was alive in this way. Okay, so after that body of work, um, I was just wandering around one day on my way to the studio and someone was throwing out this log um, that was like so out of place for Brooklyn. And um, it was like this caricature of a log. The one on the left is sort of similar to it, but it's not exactly like that. But it was this like, almost like a big hunk of driftwood or something. And, um, and it just caught my eye because it was so random. And um, I dragged it to my studio and I didn't know what I was gonna do with it, but it was like um, this kind of like game changer in a way where it made me um, pay more attention to these, this like detail that I had been trying to get from my work, like thinking about surface and structure and, um, and it just had so much character to it that I was just playing around with like making molds of it. And, um, and I started looking at a lot more of like natural things that were also in states of decay and how they were similar in a way to like parts of the body, um, like references of like bones and, um, and meat and things like that, but still keeping it more like metaphorical, um, where it's relating more to nature than, than like the body. Um, and so I started making work that was, um, figurative, but again, leaving the figure that before, um, I'd always kind of had a struggle with where it's, um, it felt like it was too um, confrontational in this way that I didn't want to, um, I kept fighting with myself. Like I, I wanted to talk about the figure, but I didn't really want to use the figure. Um, and so it was like figuring out ways that I could, I could still have that conversation without it being so um, explicit. And so all of the work, um, like I hand build and I hand cast. Um, this one is, I do a lot of flocking with like dirt and, and ash and things like that. Um, and flocking, if you don't know what that means, it's like when you kind of coat the surface with, with something that's, um, it's like an adhesive and then you like glue it to the surface. Almost like a, pool, like a felted like pool table kind of texture. Um, this is just a studio view, so you can kind of see like the scale of things. Um, everything always seems to be about my body size. Um, the sculpture on the left is like about my height. Um, I think that still has like a holdover to like dealing with the figure in a way. And things are very anamorphic in that sense, like where it could be like a head or like parts of a body. Um, Okay, so I'm just kind of skipping around a little bit, but um, I did a residency in Germany in 2008, and um, I just had like a suitcase, and I packed a bunch of drawing materials, and um, I just sort of went, and um, I was like in culture shock in a way. Like I expected people to speak more English. I didn't speak any German. There was a lot of like inner monologues with yourself, <laughs> not talking to anyone sometimes for like a couple of days. 
Um, and so I just hold myself up in my studio for a little bit and I would just like make these drawings. Um, and I was thinking a lot about home and what that means. Um, you know, like this kind of utopic idea of home and like these archetypes of what it was that I was thinking about and what I was looking for. Um, and so they're a little bit like fantastical, but um, it was just my way of like working through this situation and um, trying to figure out like what I was doing and what I wanted. And then when I got back um, to New York, um, I translated a lot of those images into sculptures. So I was using the shape that um, is kind of like a house or like an arrow or something that's slightly um, abstracted, but to me it was like, okay, this is like a home kind of shape. And using different materials, um, playing with the idea of pedestal as like an anti-pedestal, like using, I started using acrylic mirror. And so it was almost like, like a hole in the floor or something that it was like another layer, but um, but it had this like ethereal quality where it didn't really exist. And this is another piece from that series. Um, I'm still interested in this idea of like nature and industry and things feeling like really dirty and heavy in this way. Um, and I'm, obsessed with like textures and trying to get this this weight um, of the surface and um, everything started getting like blacker and more charred and greasier and um, I started using the mirrors to kind of um, add these like elements of light into that but I didn't want to do it with just paint or color um, and so the mirror in a way like there was like colored acrylic mirrors so it was a way to um, to kind of get that impression that there was there was light and there was something else that was there. Um, but because it's a mirror, it's like always changing its reflection and it's always changing the sort of spatial relationship that you have with it. And these are just some other pieces from that series. Again, using like ash and resin um, just to make these like really graphic and charred sculptures. It's just the gallery view, so you can kind of see how they all relate to each other. Um, this is a picture of the Salton Sea that's out in California. Um, I like to just go and do research to places that are considered, you know, um, horrible and toxic to other people, but um, there's something like compelling and beautiful in that like disrepair and in that um, decay. And so for me, it's like looking at textures and like absorbing the way something looks and the way something reacts and then trying to apply that to my own work in the studio. Um, so I had a studio fellowship um, where I got a free studio for the year and um, it was this really awkward space. And um, I wanted to somehow bridge the drawing work that I was doing while I was in Germany, um, but to incorporate it somehow with something that was more sculptural and more of like an installation and just working with this awkward space to make it feel like it was one, um, like one whole sculpture. And um, so I was like drawing on the walls and cutting out these panels. Um, and so the drawings on the wall go up pretty high, I guess they're about um, like 10 feet or so, but the panels in the middle there, um, I guess they're about like three or four feet. And um, the criticism that, um, and the feedback I was getting was that everybody wished it was bigger, that they were like in this landscape in a way that was, um, you know, larger than them. And so the, you were completely immersed in this space. And so, um, it was just part of this process of trying to figure out how I could push that to this next level and realizing that this piece wasn't 
very successful, but it was something that was important because it was like leading my thinking and my, um, um, my inspirations, like that I wanted to follow this through somehow and make it, um, to make it larger and figure out a way to make it more, um, powerful. And, um, I did another version in a way, um, thinking about like landscape and how, how you would interact with it in this way, if it was broken down into these flat forms and planes and, you know, how you would walk around them and they would change and kind of disappear. Um, and so I got a fellowship through Socrates Sculpture Park, which is a, it's a public park up in Queens, New York, but they invite artists every year to make a proposal. You don't have to be a sculptor. Um, you just kind of make a proposal to do a public art piece, um, which is kind of scary and challenging if you've never made anything, you know, big or you've never had the means to do it. And so the cool thing about it is that they help you. They give you funding. They have all, like, the machinery and the equipment to help you make this larger than life piece. And so I was really excited because I could take this idea that I had been wanting to do with the panels, this idea of like a sort of changing landscape and actually make it large and put it in the landscape and see, um, you know, see how that would be, see how that would feel. Um, and so it was the first time I was using steel. Um, I taught myself how to plasma cut um, and to weld, and I just made this crazy beast of a sculpture. Um, and um, we had to use this like equipment to put it together, and you know it, everything's like thousands of pounds. And um, it was this like exciting learning experience of um, of taking something that seemed um, impossible almost, and then realizing that, okay, I can do this, I can make this, um, I'm going to do it, like, let's do it. And then, you know, um, oops. And then, um, yeah, putting it together in this way. So my original thoughts for this were, um, like, geysers and things that are these temporary forms that have volume and space, um, this is the guys on the left, and then on the right, this is um, tufas and mono lake, where they're like basically calcium carbonate, so they're really fragile, but they form these massive um, spires. Um, and so I was really interested in this idea of landscape that <clears throat> is temporal and has weight and form, but it's like temporary and it's light or it's fragile and. Um, and so the piece, like as you walk around it, it grows and it shrinks and it's steel, but they're steel panels. And so, you know, if the wind blows, like they move and um, it's this kind of like contrast between something that you expect to be like really heavy and kind of oppressive, but it's, it's actually much more fragile and a lot lighter than, than you would think. Um, and also working in the public was a complete change from working in your studio where it's, you know, it's just like you and you don't have random people coming up to you and asking you all these questions or like kids jumping on your work and dogs peeing on things and, you know, um, and just seeing how excited people are about, they don't understand your piece or they want to talk to you about what you're doing and they want to give their two cents on how you should make something and, um, and yeah, so it was like a really exciting <coughs> learning experience. Um, and I had, I guess I had a couple months to do this. So it was like learning, like basically learning everything from scratch and figuring out how to do it. And um, um, I think it turned out pretty well. <laughs> and then I went back to my studio and um, started making everything smaller again. <laughs> um, but still thinking about uh, portability and this idea of making portable landscapes and things that um, have this quality to them that feel like they're moved from somewhere else or they're in a place where they're going to be moved to somewhere else. Um, but there's this like idea of motion and a sort of temporary quality about them. 
um, things that have like arms or something on it where it feels like you can lift it and move it around. And then, um, still thinking about like the sort of portability, but the absurdity of that. Um, I was doing research into balancing rocks and um, just this interest in weight and the almost like the tension that it has where um, it could move or it has this potential of, you know, it rolling or moving or just standing in this really odd position that doesn't seem natural. It doesn't seem like it's, it's sturdy and safe. Um, and looking at cairns, which are like the little rocks in the front, if you don't know what they are, people usually leave them when they're hiking to like, you know, to denote like a pathway or um, as like a little monument to like dead relatives or things like that. But they're usually like rocks that are piled and balanced on top of each other in this way that's like precarious um, and I started making drawings um, I guess that were more collages this time figuring out ways to to play with balance and gravity and it's easy to do that in a drawing because there's you know you can do whatever there's no there's no rules um, you can defy gravity and so I was making these drawings that were kind of playing with that and also just playing with um, with images and, and photographs. And so these are all mixed media, like there's, um, there's photographs, there's like cast urethane, there's, um, prints and like photo transfers and, um, and then I got invited to make a public sculpture um, in Brooklyn and um, I wanted to take what I was thinking about with the balancing rocks um, and these ideas of like awkward landscapes and, um, and translate that into a sculpture and so um, I made this one it's all everything I do is like much lighter than it looks um, and so this idea of kind of like a city landscape in a way where there's like a trash foil ball then there's like more of like a natural rock and then everything's perched in this way so that it's like above your head um, and if you're standing underneath it it looks like it might fall on top of you um, then after that piece I got um, a fellowship to go out to Franconia Sculpture Park which is in Minnesota um, and it's similar to Socrates where they invite artists to come and make public sculpture um, and so I was like, okay, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I'm going to figure out a way to make another big piece. Um, and I had written proposals, and um, they had accepted them, but I drove out there, and it was like a couple days drive, and um, I just was not happy with my proposal. And the whole drive, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to change it. and. Um, driving myself crazy, like I didn't sleep for a couple days worrying about what I was going to do because I had less than a month to make a sculpture. Um, and I had been doing all the work with the bouncing rocks and I had done that other piece and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to do something like this, um, but just on a much larger scale. And so um, yeah, I had um, a month and I just started building so I hand built everything. Um, the main rocks are built out of concrete and then they're um, positioned on top of these steel beams. And then um, we had all sorts of crazy equipment that I had never even considered that I had to use. <laughs> and so just to drill the holes for the steel to go in had to go down like six feet. And so we hired this guy who lived across the street and he had this auger. Um, and you're in the Midwest where, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, like, I've never been to the Midwest. Everyone was like, yeah, we'll do it, whatever, you know, I'll drive my tractor over and <laughs> we'll help you out. And so, um, so it was this amazing process. They have a lot of interns that work there to help you 
and yeah, it was like craning everything and like big wieldy, like thousands of pounds of steel um, that we were, you know, putting together. But yeah, so it was like this amazing, amazing process to make the sculpture, which was the biggest sculpture I've ever made. And I don't know how I did it. It was like one of those projects where you're just on autopilot and you're working 12 to 15 hour days every day um, for a month because you're on this timeline and you know you don't have time to stop and think like how am I going to do this or what am I doing and um, there's people there to help you but everyone's like you know they're on their own time schedule <coughs> and I'm like out there like from New York like come on this has to be done like I need this done tomorrow and they're like oh no I gotta work tomorrow I'll be here you know in a couple days and um and just realizing like how you have to work with others and how you kind of have to relax and like just feel like all right this is gonna get done somehow um and I guess I also titled the title of the lecture is the title of this piece which is the impossibility of an island and I think for me it was this metaphor on so many levels of like making this impossible project happen and um, and just figuring out like all the logistics and realizing that um, you know you have these ideas and sometimes you have no idea how you're going to make it happen but when you're determined to do it you can totally do it and, um, and figuring out how to do it is kind of part of the fun it's challenging and it's stressful but um, sort of part of what you do in a way um, and then this is the most recent body of work that I've been doing. Um, still working with the idea of like balancing rocks and landscape in this abstracted way. Um, but again, going back on like a smaller studio gallery scale. Um, and this one is very similar to the other with like the foil and sort of like kind of the smaller thing like balancing, um, like the smaller fragile thing balancing something that's like much heavier and should be like much heavier and weightier and almost like absurd about the fact that this relationship is happening. Um, so this is a gallery view of this work. Um, this show just came down a couple weeks ago. Um, but everything is cast concrete and steel and um, thinking about balancing rocks and scholar rocks and this idea of um, almost like domesticating landscape in this way, of um, bringing it to this like more intimate scale. <laughs> 